Hello ladies and gents, welcome to another video. I paid way too much for this Xbox Series X on eBay and today we're going to try and fix it. So this Xbox Series X was up on auction on eBay and I paid £380 plus £15 in postage. So a total of £395, I'll leave a US dollar conversion on the screen down below. But yeah that's way too much and apparently this suffers with a black screen and it doesn't display anything when it starts up so hopefully we're going to be able to fix it and hopefully we're going to be able to make some money back but with that being said if you are new to the channel and you like this type of content then i would really appreciate it if number one you get subscribed and turn on the bell notifications got lots of exciting content coming and number two, give the video an early thumbs up. It makes me look really, really popular and makes my parents really proud of me. So that being said, let's get into today's video. Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN. Long gone are the days where a VPN was just a way to hide your identity online. Using a VPN not only masks your identity, but it also encrypts and protects your personal data, whether you're at home, at work, or out and about using public Wi-Fi. NordVPN allows you to connect securely and safely wherever you are in the world. Personally, I use a VPN for several reasons. One of those reasons is to watch movies and shows which aren't ever released here in the UK. Another reason though I like NordVPN is because it allows me to bypass a ban which Amazon placed on my IP address just because I return one too many items. As many of my viewers will know, Amazon decided that they didn't want me as a customer anymore because I was too fussy when it came to product quality. By using NordVPN, I'm able to bypass those blocks and still order stuff with same day delivery. But the best part of it all is that it works on both Windows and Android, as well as all major operating systems. You can get started with NordVPN by heading over to nordvpn.com forward slash console fix or by clicking on the link in the video description or the top pin comment. A big, big thank you to NordVPN for making this video possible. Now let's get back to it. Okay, so just taking a look at the eBay listing then. As you can see, you won this auction. And if we scroll down, we can see £380 plus £15 postage. Now, one interesting thing is when I purchased this, the seller sent me a message. And he sent me a message saying basically that he was going to pack it all up that night. This was on Sunday and then he was going to post the special delivery the next day. That was yesterday. He arrived this morning and, you know, absolutely fantastic. I ordered it on Sunday uh, or rather I paid for it on Sunday. And uh, yeah, he he got it sent straight out Monday morning and it arrived this morning. So two day shipping, not bad at all. But if we take a look at the description here, it says Xbox Series X console faulty. It was working fine with no issues last week and then turning it on the other day. TV came up with no video. If you leave it for a few minutes, the TV will get a signal and it will come up with a black screen. But at that point, I didn't know what to do, so I turned it off. Maybe an easy fix for someone who knows what they're doing. It's two months out of warranty and Microsoft wanted £250 just to look at it. As I have a game into it, PC2, I can't justify it. Now, this is a private seller. And one interesting thing, and one thing that did kind of reassure me a little bit, was the fact that the seller sent me a message. Just after we started speaking, he sent me a message and said, Oh, by the way, are you the guy off YouTube? So, yeah. He knew who I was, and basically the reason he knew who I was was because his friend had told him to basically check out some of my videos to see if there's anything that could possibly help him. Obviously, he's tried some of the things that he can try, and yeah he it was no good so obviously he sold it on ebay so it should be a genuine listing i do 100 percent have faith in this console in that it hasn't been messed with and i'll show you why in a second so as you can see 82 with 100 percent positive feedback i'm going to leave in positive feedback no matter what because this console hasn't been opened and that's exactly what i was going to show you so as you can see the sticker here is still fully intact so there's a sticker here, so there's a screw there, a green screw there, and there's a green screw just under there as well. So there's two stickers, and those are fully intact. So that means that it hasn't been messed with, which is great, because that means that we've got more chance of actually being able to fix it. One thing I am going to try and do, actually, let's turn it on first. Let's just see if we do get any display. I'm not seeing any kind of uh, signs of damage to the HDMI port, so that's interesting. But let's just see if we do get any kind of display when we turn it on. 
So I've already got a Series X now, but my partner said she might want this depending on how well the video does. I've got to try and make some money back. I've paid way too much for this. Okay, so that turns on. No free disc, that sucks, but never mind. So we do get the white Xbox light. Let's pop over to the capture card. We'll see what's going on. Okay, and as you can see there, we do have no signal on the Elgato capture card. So when we've got no signal input, it will come up with this screen on my capture card. For those of you wondering, I use a Elgato Camlink Pro. It's a four port PCI Express capture card. Expensive, but well worth it because it means I can connect all my HDMI sources up, but very much worth it. So I'm going to leave that for a mini but let's just give it a visual inspection here i am going to leave it for a minute and just see if anything shows up but it looks like the console hasn't been dropped it doesn't look like it's been abused in any way it looks in really good condition it come with the box and i think that's just a bit of crap off my desk so that's fine so it doesn't look as though it's been dropped i could be wrong obviously but it doesn't appear that way but, yeah, everything seems absolutely fine in terms of condition. So there's still nothing showing up at all on this. I am going to give the cable a wiggle while I'm doing what I'm doing, while I'm looking at it. And wiggling the cable doesn't appear to be doing anything at all. Okay, so I think I've seen enough there. Shut that down. Okay, interestingly, that's not shutting down. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be turning back on. Okay, I'm going to press and hold the button here. See if it wants to shut itself down completely. There we go. So that's interesting how that's not doing anything. I'm really hoping this isn't the SSD. So what I'll do is I will fast forward through this. And obviously, you know, if you do want to see a complete teardown of this, iFixit do have a full guide which can help. I highly recommend checking that out. We're pretty much in now. We don't need that top part for now because that's the Southbridge board. The HDMI circuit is on this side so we should be good with just working on this side of the board or rather on this board layer just as soon as i get to pop this off there we go finally let's just double check that awesome seems okay all right so the area that I'm going to be focusing on mainly is going to be around here and around here. That's going to be the HDMI circuit. And as you can see, if you follow those traces there, it goes from the HDMI port into an encoder and then down to the APU. It actually goes the other way. It comes from the APU to the encoder and then to the HDMI port. But that's basically the HDMI circuit in a nutshell. So let's just pop under the microscope and we'll take a look and see if we can figure this one out. Okie dokie, so starting off with the HDMI port then, what I'm going to do first, I'm just going to give these a little bit of a nudge, to see if we've got any broken pins, that is fairly common on these, nope, absolutely not, alright, so nothing at all there, so let's just have a look on the back here then. So this area here is the ESD boost I see. It's basically, I believe it boosts the 5 volt input uh, for the HDMI port. So you've got to have 5 volts on the HDMI port for the TV to know when the HDMI cable is plugged in and also for 5 volt return. So the TV tells the console that a TV is plugged in. So basically, this is responsible for boosting that, uh, or I believe so anyway. And they can go bad, and it's actually pretty common on the Xbox One X. 
to be honest. So I'm just going to test around there, see if we've got any shorts. So multimeter in continuity mode. Ooh. We do have a short there on C25. Uh-oh. That might be a bad ESD, I see. I believe that is pin 18 on the port itself. Let's just have a look at pin 18. So even though that says 19 there, ignore that. That one is pin 19. This one here is pin 18. Let's have a look to ground. Nope. Ah. Okay. Huh. Okay, we don't get a short on pin 19 or 18. So that might be the input side. But C25 is not meant to be short. And it is. So do we have a short on this transistor here? Yes. And as far as I know, this isn't meant to be short. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove that transistor. See, the problem is the ESD boosts I see, it can be replaced, but you can't buy them. Or you probably can, but no one knows what the part number is because we've got no schematics for these. So basically, you can get them off an Xbox One X board as well, but we don't actually know the part number for them. We know the part number for the Xbox One S, I think it's HDMI C24 or something like that. Uh, ST Micron Electronics or something along those lines. Well, I have had issues with this transistor here before causing uh, not only display issues, but also causing issues with power as well, beep on beep off. I believe it's some sort of a five volt regulator of some sort, I don't know exactly what it is, but I do know where to get one from. And that is an original Xbox One board. I've got my hot air at 460 degrees Celsius at the minute, 40% airflow. This is a very high thermal mass area by the way. Let's just give it a helping hand here. So a bit of flux. And then I'm going to get some leaded solder. Okay, finally. Finally that came off. Move it out of the way. Uh, let's check again for a short on that pin. And it is still shorted. Ooh, that might be the ESD. All right. Well, I'm sure we can figure this out. So, let's go for the next seemingly obvious thing that could be, could be causing a short. Well, that cap's gone. See ya. <laughs> I wonder if I can find it. There she is. Found that without the skull. Uh, 
Alright, so let's just leave that there a second and let's test again for sure. It's probably not going to get rid of it. No, nope. knew it. Oh, well, I didn't know it, but. You know, it's pretty uh, unlikely to be that. So, just to be clear, the ESD boost IC is the last thing I'm going to be taking off. And I mean the very last thing because it is BGA and I don't have any pre board. Okay. Time to remove that cap there because the short still hasn't gone. So I could inject voltage here, but I don't really want to inject voltage into this. Or the encoder on the other side. Keep that safe there. And let's see if it's disappeared. No. Oh, damn it. This is looking more and more like the ESD I see. I am going to remove the encoder next because that's going to be on the same circuit, I believe. Actually, no, it's not on the same circuit. I don't think. All right, well, let's just remove this encoder then. I'll have to reboil it. If that's not the cause, I mean. Did I say any colder then? I meant ESD, I see. Okay. So, yeah, the ESD I see is not too bad of a chip. But it's also not the most fun chip to reboard as well. A lot of the time you can just get away with running the iron over it. Oh, no. Oh, the short's not gone. I think it's voltage injection time, to be honest. Which is pretty annoying. All right, so I've got my... Voltage set at 1.4 volt, which is probably too much. So I'm going to set it at 1 volt. Um, we get 0.048, and then it's just dropped down to nothing. Huh? Okay, let's go to 1.5 volt here. Nothing. Has it really just burnt itself out that quickly? I have actually come across that before where the short just burns itself out. Still nothing at 2 volts. I believe this is a 5 volt line, so we should be safe enough. 0 0.008 volts at 3 volts. Or amps, sorry. 80 milliamps. Let me just check for a short. Let me see if that short's decided it wants to burn itself out. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that short's gone. Oh, come on. <laughs> Is that really all it took to kill you? So I'll just run the iron over that. All right. Hopefully that's good enough. Let's just see if we've got a short. Nope. Hmm. 
Now I'll show And I'll show it there. Well, hopefully that's good. that's all it's gonna need. <laughs> a little zap with uh, with one volt to get it working. But basically, what happened there was I injected one volt and saw it bump up to 80 milliamps, and then all of a sudden it just went flat, no current draw at all, and the short was gone. So yeah, <laughs> very very weird indeed. But let's just see if that's good enough to get it to display. I'm going to use the cable I know works. Plug that in there. Come on, there we go. Turn it on. It turns on. Let's see if it displays. Hmm. No. Doesn't appear to. So I'm thinking I've probably got to replace that ESD IC. Okay, okay. So let's get this back apart then. So this is why I'm glad I didn't put it all back together because it would have been a pain to take it all back apart again just for testing purposes. All right, so I'm going to take this ESDIC back off and I think I'm going to try reboiling it properly first before I end up replacing it. I do have a Series S which I've been using as a donor board, but this board does actually work and I don't want to take the ESDIC off this if I can help it. So I'll reboil this one and uh, see what happens with it. So let's just get this off first of all. Okay, I'm gonna pop that to one side where I can find it. So we've got a bit of reflection on here because, well, the chip's shiny on the bottom, so not really a lot I can do there, but it's all good. So it's really tricky even just to re-ball this because it's difficult to wick it. It's a very small chip and it's pretty hard to handle. Okie dokie, so now we're ready to basically just re-ball this, so I'm going to be using some 0.25mm solder balls, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take a tad of flux on the end of my tweezers there, spread a minimal amount around it. Okie doke, I've got a brand new pair of tweezers. So you can see those are the perfect size. Oh, I think that's covered every pad, I think. Here where there is think. Uh, there's only so much I can see with the reflections. So I'm going to drop my airflow right the way down to 1%. And I'm going to remove my nozzle. My hot air is still at 440, but I'm just going to basically hold the chip in my tweezers. And just flow these solder balls on. 
Hopefully they don't move. Okay, let's let that cool down. And the map's expanded a bit, but that's fine. Add some flux there as well, just to be able to reflow this now. I'm going to 20% airflow. Oh, uh -huh, hang on. Ah, one's moved. And actually, I don't think there's meant to be a pad on it. Nope. So I'd put one ball where there shouldn't have been one. And that's done. Fully reballed. Beautiful. Okay. That should be pretty much locked in there. So when I reflow this now, we should see it move in a minute as it falls into place. Okay, it didn't move on its own, but... Hmm, actually... I'm not overly keen on that. That should be good. Just trying to figure out if that's good. It looks fine. So I can see a solder ball right on the corner, just there. And that seems to line up with that resistor. So the one way to try and find out if it's good is going to be to just get some diode readings. So I'll grab my multimeter and go into diode mode. That means red probe on ground, black probe on the component I want to test. That appears short again, unless that's just a cap holding charge. No, that can't be a cap holding charge. Because that's short everywhere now. I think that chip might actually be bad. Yep, I'm going to have to take one from a donor board. Yeah, there's no more shorts there now that chip's removed. And that definitely wasn't merged. Not by the look of those solder balls on the pads. Well, I'll take one from this donor board, which I didn't want to do. But I'm going to have to. So I'll take one from the donor board. And if that don't work, then I'm going to have to bypass it. I mean, this donor board that I'm taking it from, I'm not going to be able to get the MOSFETs anytime soon. So I can't really fix this until such a time when I get another donor board. And if I get another donor board, then I'll get another ESDIC. So, yeah. Should be fine. I know the ball works, but I took two MOSFETs off 
to confirm that another board was fixable and then didn't put them back on this one. I left them on the other one because it didn't really make a difference which one they was on. Alright, I'm hoping that's good. Let's just give a quick test now. Why does it keep on bridging? I don't know if I've moved it too far over, to be honest. So for some reason, as soon as I put a diode on these, or rather a diode pack, ESDIC, I'll get bridges. Yeah, as soon as I do. Huh. I wonder if it's killing them when I'm taking them off or when I'm reboarding them. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bypass it. I don't think I've got any more choice at this point. Alright, so to bypass this HDMI IC, what we need to do is we need to create bridges between certain pads. using jumper wires. So I'm just going to tin some wire here. Okay, let's just expose a bit of this trace here just to make myself a new pad and make my life a little bit easier. Alright, that bypass is run, so the jumper wires are where they need to be, let me just clean this up. So the jumper wires are where they need to be, as you can see there. So basically what we do here is we just recreate these connections which would have been on, on the chip itself. So we go from this trace here to here, and then from here to here. We also go from this pad here, which is this cap, to this trace here, which is this resistor. We go from this resistor here to this end of the cap. And we go from this resistor here to this end of this cap. And that basically just recreates the four traces what we need in order to recreate the circuit. So normally what I would do is I would put some conformal coating down now, but I'm not going to see this as a permanent fix. What I'm planning on doing with this, if I can get this working, I don't think it's going to be a wise move to sell it as it is. So what I'll likely do with this is keep it myself and sell mine, because mine is fully working with the HDMI ESDIC on there. So I'd keep this one myself and basically 
sell mine and then in a couple of months or a couple of weeks whenever I can get a chip one that I know works then I'll basically uh, I'll basically put a new chip on it alright that'll do that'll do so let's just give it a test I very much doubt this is going to work, but we never know. If it don't work, then I think I'm going to have to carry on with it tomorrow. But just for testing purposes, I'm not going to put any more fresh paste on it or anything. I just want to reassemble it roughly, just for testing, because it is getting late. So I think I should probably carry on with this tomorrow. Here we go. So it's turned on. Whoops, it's falling out, but it's turned on. And uh, no. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Let me just try it on the TV, but that's doubtful. It's going to work. I won't flick any cameras because it means setting one up. Uh, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't pick up at all. Alright, well, I think it's time to call it a night on this, so I'm going to have to carry on with this tomorrow, unfortunately. So, that'll be a second for you, it'll be about 12 hours for me. Right, okay, so it's the next evening now, and I haven't done anything to this, so basically, it got a little bit too late last night, and I really just couldn't carry on with it. So, I'm doing it again now, so I'm just trying to sort a few things out here. But, yeah, this is very, very strange. So, after I finished recording last night, it was sort of detecting on the TV, but then no display. So, it was coming up on my TV that I had a display detected, saying that it was detecting a display and that it would switch to that device in, you know, five seconds or something stupid. So, it detected the device, but then it just wouldn't pick anything up when it did display. So... I've got a feeling that the encoder is probably bad. Now, I do have another problem here, and that is the fact that even if I get this working now, I can't resell it. However, I do have another console. I have another Series X. I have my own, which, quite honestly, has made more than two times the amount that I paid for it just in YouTube revenue alone. So what I think I'm going to do with this is if I can fix it, and I can get it to actually work, then what I'll do is I'll sell mine and just, you know, basically call that uh, call that a win sort of thing, and then I'll keep this one for myself because obviously I've got the Series X for myself, but I can't really sell this one, and I'll be honest, I don't want to keep two Series Xs because, you know, yes, my partner does use the Xbox, but she's got her own Series S, and I can't really justify such an expensive machine for the amount she uses it. And plus, she only plays, you know, standard games like uh, things that don't benefit from true native 4K. So, I don't think I can justify that sort of cost just for her to play um, a Series X. Now, what I could do is keep it for a week or so, see how the video is doing. If the videos pay for it, then maybe, and maybe sell one of the Series S's. So my partner's Series S, I could sell that, give her this, and recoup a little bit of money that way. I'll have to see. I'll definitely have to see. But what I'm thinking I'm going to do now is I'm just going to replace the encoder and basically take it from there i'm really hoping to get this up and running i don't want to call this a no fix so hopefully everything's going to work out here but it's an expensive purchase if i can't get this working i might even end up having to do two videos on this because all i know is that i was recording for about three hours last night on this now i don't know how long of that i was just messing around how much breaks i took and things like that but we'll see we'll see Alright, so let me have a look at this ESD bypass first. Let me make sure I've actually done that correctly. Right, so here it is then. 
and I believe it's done correctly. It does look like it's done properly. Now, obviously, I haven't conformed or coated this. There is a reason for that. So the reason I haven't conformed or coated this is because I don't want to leave this like this. And as soon as I get an available ESD, I see I'm going to be putting one back on. And I'm not going to give up until I actually get one to not short out. I don't know why they keep shorting out, but they just seem to. It's really weird. But yeah, my next port of call is going to be this chip here. So this is the HDMI encoder. Um, you can buy these. They are on AliExpress now, but they are fairly expensive. But I'm going to take one from a donor board, I think. I have got some new ones, but I'm going to steal one from a donor. This is very odd, it's not coming off. I'm going to take my nozzle off and I'm going to do it from above the board. It's not coming off and I'm at 470 degrees. Wow, it's not coming off. Oh, I'm doing everything I can to get this off and it's not doing it. Okay, finally, that took way too long. That was scarily long for the encoder to come off. Look, I can feel heat over this side of the board. It's, that's not normal. That's not normal at all. Yeah, that took far too long to come off. And honestly, I just was not happy with how long that took. Well, that cheap, if it wasn't Freud, it probably is now, so that won't be going back on the board. Alright, so you may have noticed a little bit of a jump cut there, and the reason for that is because my HDMI cable keeps flickering for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I've just switched to a different capture card, or rather a different port on the capture card. This is certainly pretty tight here. Okie doke. So I've just turned the board around because it is really awkward. There's so little space to work. There's a SSD extension socket right next to it. There's a power socket right next to it, which I've now melted. There's the actual SSD socket. There's caps, there's coils. It's so confined. And I've got the shakes. Ah! All right, I think that should have had it. Man, that was frustrating. I've got the shakes, it's not helping. Honestly, it just feels like absolutely everything is getting in my way at the minute. I think I'm going to use the micro pencil.
All right, that's lined up. And so is that side. All right. So there's my Series X encoders. I did end up putting a brand new one on. Just keep that slightly in view so people can't say I switched it. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to waste any extra thermal paste. I'm just going to leave it as it is and I'll give the board a really good clean if I get it working. Okay, so that's back together enough to test. Turns on. Oh, and it's still not displaying. No. I'm trying it on the TV. I'm thinking maybe something to do with the SSD now, to be honest. Nope. It's still not displaying. Nothing at all. Nothing on the TV, nothing on the capture card. Nothing at all. Just to be on the safe side. No, nothing. Nothing at all. Well, right now, this is a pretty expensive loss. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to write it off. It does turn on. There's got to be a way to get this working. So there's going to be a follow-up video to this, I think. Um, I don't think I've got much choice, to be honest. But, I mean, in terms of the console itself, I don't know if I'd actually lose much money by reselling the parts. I know I could probably get well over £100 for the hard drive for the SSD, uh, if I can confirm it's working, which I do have a reader, so I could potentially clone my own operating system onto this ssd just to test it in my console to confirm whether it's working that's an option so i could resell the ssd power supply the disk drive is not really worth much um the heatsink fan motherboard case secondary motherboard um well they'd actually probably get kept as donors but yeah i mean i don't know how much i'd actually lose but at the minute, it don't look good for this console, and unfortunately, I just can't think of what else it could possibly be. So, I think there's going to be a revisit on this. Um, I'm not going to give up on it, and even if I don't fix it, I don't think I'd resell the part, because one day we might come across a cure, even if I can't figure it out now. So, with that being said, that is going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you do have any comments or questions, leave them down in the comment section down below. I always do my best to answer. Uh, you know, maybe you know, maybe you've come across this yourself, and you know what's wrong, and maybe you could give me some pointers. There's definitely going to be a revisit on this one, no matter what. Um, so 100%, I will be be uh, doing a second video. So keep an eye out for that. If you're not subscribed, make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss it. And if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. It really does help out the channel, helps with the algorithm, and helps me to know which kind of videos people like and which ones people don't like. If you do want to support me in any way, then you can do so by using the Patreon link in the video description, and you can become a Patreon supporter. You can also become a Twitch Prime subscriber by heading over to Amazon and clicking on the subscribe button. Link your Amazon Prime account, and it's completely free for you to do, but it gives me around about 250 every month, and it does massively help out the channel. You can also become a channel member by clicking on the join button just below the video. That all helps as well. It all goes towards making these videos and helps me to keep doing what I'm doing. So with that being said, that is going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'll see you later. Bye for now.